It's so great, great to have you all. My name is Zach Ford. I'm a senior program manager at Age United. I oversee our harm reduction and drug user health portfolio on our grant making side. Um, so that includes the syringe access fund, which I think most folks um, who are familiar with Age United's grant making work are familiar with. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon for the syringe access session. Um, so we've titled this session, HIV Viral Hepatitis and Overdose Syndemic. We've got some really fantastic panelists for you today that are gonna go through several different things. I think, um, you know, when we talk about um, HIV advocacy, there are so many things that intersect with that. And um, for me and the work that I do at Age United, the, um, the primary intersection there is, is substance use um, and injection drug use. And so again, when you start talking about substance use, you start talking about even more intersections. And so we've brought together a few panelists today that are gonna talk about their work um, and help share some information about that with us, but also to give us some really practical tips for advocacy, specifically around syringe services, harm reduction services, and drug user health. Um, so to make sure we have plenty of time for presentations and Q&A, I will pass things over um, by sharing my screen. Da, da, da. All right. Um, so first up, we have Austin Jones from AMFAR. Austin? Great, thanks Zach, um, and hello to everyone. Thanks very much for joining. Um, I'm actually presenting in place of my boss today, Greg Millette, who uh, was hoping to be here, but he got booked on a, another AIDS Watch um, webinar at the exact same time, so he's on that one as well. Um, so yeah, the title of my talk is uh, Challenges to Addressing HIV Among uh, People Who Inject Drugs, um, and we can just go to the next slide and get right into it. So I think many of us have been using this framework for um, a number of years now, which is thinking about, as Zach said, not just the opioid epidemic or substance use or HIV or hepatitis C in silos, but uh, as a syndemic and thinking about the ways in which they uh, exacerbate each other. Um, and we can go to the next slide. I think this has been uh, in the national conversation for a number of years now. Um, sparked by the Scott, the Scott County outbreak in Indiana in 2015 and 2016. And I think many folks saw that as sort of like a canary in the coal mine, and, and maybe we're going to see more HIV outbreaks uh, associated with injection drug use in the coming years than we had uh, in the years before that. And unfortunately, that's proven to be the case. Um, just going to go through a few examples here, but you can see uh, an outbreak in Massachusetts, which happened uh, about two years ago. Uh, one in North Seattle, and then if we just hit two more, I think, um, yeah, one in Portland, Oregon, and uh, the one that continues to go on in Cable County in West Virginia, which at last count had um, 80 people in the cluster there. Uh, next slide. Um, and of course, in Northern Kentucky as well, there was a, a community where the most common risk factor for HIV transmission was uh, IV drug use for the first time in Kentucky's history. So um, at AMFAR, we've been involved in this conversation for a, a few years now, and the, we, were having, we were finding it difficult to talk to policymakers and to academics and journalists and, and sometimes other advocates about the ways in which these things intersect. So what we did is um, we put together a database, which if we go to the next slide, um, you can see uh, the homepage here. So this is, you can find this at opioid.amfar.org. There's a ton of information on here, uh, national maps down to district, uh, congressional district information. Um, but I, I wanna go through really quickly um, just one feature on here, which is hopefully useful for you uh, as you go through uh, your meetings in, in the weeks to come. So if we- um, Austin, just wanna break in for one second. Is it possible for you to put this up in slideshow rather than presenter form? Oh. Uh, I'm not on control, so oh. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Hang on, sorry, that's me. I thought, um, sorry, let me fix it. Sorry, everyone. No worries. Uh, slideshow? Yes. 
Is is you are you still seeing presenter? Still seeing the next animation thing. What about now? That looks good to me. Looks better, yeah. I think that's good. Okay, cool. Great. So yeah, um, if we hit next, it's just gonna play a really short video of, of a way to navigate this. Um, and I hope so. Yeah, so there it goes. Um, I, on our homepage, there's some really high level statistics and importantly, a, a video down here, which we'll go through kind of more slowly than I'm about to uh, in, in more depth what some of the things you can do here are. But if you click on find your state and find your state, you're taken to a, a state page, which will have two side by side maps um, with a number of indicators that are selectable. You could customize this in whatever way that you want to. Um, further down, there are some state statistics uh, that can show what's going on in your state and compare to the country, some state level uh, policies that are relevant for this discussion and some graphs that can show how your state has compared to the country over the last several years uh, on, on a few indicators. And then finally, there is um, some information on federal funding to your state, and at the bottom, some, some county level information. There's also some, uh, a news feature, which uh, we encourage you to look at, and you can download a lot of this information on a PDF. Um, and then finally, on our about page, there's some, some really high level written information and our data sources. So everything that's on the site, you can go here and see exactly where it came from. Uh, there's also a contact us button there, um, which has a link to an email that you can contact, contact us with any sort of questions that you have. Um, and I'll also share my email in the chat so people can reach out to me directly if you have questions. Um, so with that, we can sort of move on to the second part of the presentation, which is to talk a little bit about what um, the challenges are to progress um, in this field. I think we all know that there's a long way to go. And even when it seems like we've won a battle, um, it sometimes comes back up to bite us. Um, so on the next slide, we can see one of those cases is in Indiana where very, uh, you know, famously sort of infamously, there was the, the Scott County outbreak and you would think that this is a place that should really understand the value of syringe exchange and yet um, there's still battles being fought to, to maintain access not you know even growing access is difficult but but stopping it from being rolled back um, we can go to the next slide and a similar thing in West Virginia which has um, some of the highest rates of hepatitis C in the country and yet Last year in a couple of the jurisdictions, their uh, really severe uh, rules went into place, which made it so that some syringe programs had to close and others had to drastically reduce their access um, or reach. Uh, and this has coincided with the increase in hepatitis C cases and with the HIV outbreak that we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, go to the next slide. And unfortunately, I think this is in part because uh, we haven't yet won the popular opinion battle about um, syringe exchange and harm reduction generally. This is just a, a couple of graphs from the la from public opinion polls from the past couple of years. And this is changing, I think, because we, you know, we've won um, state level legalization battles in a number of states over the last few years, which has been really encouraging, but there's still sort of a long way to go. Um, the next slide. Uh, this includes for other harm reduction in like safe injection sites where the uh, Federal Department of Justice is actively right now suing to stop Philadelphia from opening their safe injection site. And in California, uh, the legislature actually passed a bill, but it was vetoed by a Democratic governor. So um, still a long ways to go. Next slide. And of course, it's also important, I think, um, to make sure that we're not talking about this as just opioids. Um, we know that there's huge overlaps with all sorts of uh, other substance use, including meth and cocaine and, and other drugs. And this is important not just to be inclusive of people, but also because it has real consequences for policy. One of the things that we've seen over the past few years is that a lot of the resources that have been put out by the federal government have been designed to only be used for opioids and it's only within the last month or so that some of those restrictions have started to come off. And the next slide. 
And, you know, just to say, I think we still have a long ways to go in even tackling the opioid epidemic on its own. Um, this is just a, a little animation, which maybe will loop, maybe won't, but it, it, it shows that, um, you know, we're in a little bit of a better place with opioids than other drugs in that there are FDA approved um, medications which can be used to treat an opioid use disorder. And yet, even though there's lots of places in the United States that call themselves quote unquote substance abuse facilities, uh, over half of them don't offer any of these drugs and most of them offer none, uh, almost none of them offer all three, which would maybe be the best place to have a conversation from about what's best for the client. Uh, on the next slide, um, and we know that um, we just hit next one more time. Uh, we know that there are problems uh, for people living with HIV who are also people who inject drugs. And uh, this is just showing that for people who inject drugs, rates of sustained viral suppression are lower than for other transmission categories, not only overall, but across all three of the racial and ethnic groups that are listed here. Go to the next one. And one more. Um, you know, I think a lot of people have been involved in this conversation over the past few years about talking about what's similar between the opioid crisis and the HIV crisis. And now, actually, I think we're seeing a flood of articles about what's similar between the HIV crisis and the coronavirus uh, crisis that we're experiencing right now. Um, and so these are a few of the similarities that we see. I, I really want to, I mean, stigma is a, a driving factor for all of this. Um, and I, But I want to focus on the last two here, which are the slow, like the pace of the government's response in the face of the crisis. And I'm actually not seeing the bottom one here on my screen. Oh, I forget what it is. Um, oh, uh, prioritizing effective um, interventions um, has also been a problem. Um, if we go to the next slide, just want to like really briefly highlight that these are huge problems in the coronavirus uh, response. And it's a shame that we didn't learn those lessons the first two times um, with HIV and, and with opioid use. Um, but do want to highlight resources um, for people thinking about safer drug use during the outbreak um, from harm reduction and others there on the right. And then my last slide is the next one, which is just to say that you know, I think um, we've had a sort of a moment over the past few years where lots of policymakers have been interested in talking about people who use drugs in a way that hasn't happened beforehand. And with the coronavirus um, crisis right now, uh, the work that you all are going to be doing in the weeks ahead just becomes even more important. Um, because there's always a danger that when we move on to the next crisis as a country, we kind of forget the one that we were focused on before. So with all of the resources going out the door um, right now to fight the coronavirus uh, uh, crisis, yeah, I just wanna um, thank everyone for, for the work to make sure that we don't lose focus on um, people who use drugs. Uh, and then on the last one is just acknowledgement for everyone else in the uh, AMPAR policy office, including Greg, who uh, contributed to this presentation. I'm happy to take questions at the end and I'll share my email for uh, other questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Austin. And we're going to go right into the next portion, which I will pass over to Jada. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Jada Hicks with the Center for HIV Law and Policy. I'm going to give a little bit of background um, on the criminalization of viral hepatitis and how that came to be. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of background, um, there's definitely a crossover and intersection between HIV criminalization and viral hepatitis criminalization. So the past several years, we've seen a number of key developments. Um, we saw the criminalization of viral hepatitis as an HIV reform strategy in Iowa so that the law wouldn't be HIV specific. They actually encompassed other diseases. Um, we've seen states proposing new criminal laws where uh, hepatitis was not criminalized and then when they go to reform the HIV criminal laws, they add in a section to criminalize viral hepatitis as well, um, or that they just create a new section to criminalize viral hepatitis. We've seen ongoing prosecutions of people living with viral hepatitis uh, for alleged exposure. Uh, actually, one just came through my inbox this morning, so still happening. Um, and obviously with the opioid crisis, we've seen a major increase in the burden and um, prevalence of viral hepatitis. 
uh, most of these laws have come about at the same time as those targeting people um, living with HIV. Next slide, please. So just as a little bit of background so that we can segue into viral uh, hepatitis criminalization, HIV criminalization is the arrest, prosecution, and imprisonment of people living with HIV for things that are perfectly legal or only minor crimes for someone who's not tested positive. So your HIV status plus whatever conduct or action you are engaging in um, is used to single you out for uniquely harsh discriminatory treatment by the criminal legal system. Next slide. So there are over 30 states that criminalize um, HIV and have HIV specific criminal laws. Typically what we're seeing with these laws are non-disclosure before consensual sex, spitting, um, biting, other modes of exposure to bodily fluids that's usually with police officers, mental health facilities, or correctional officers. Um, usually substances we know have little to no risk of transmission. We're also seeing enhancements or additional penalties for sex workers. Um, they can also be prosecuted under the general criminal laws as well. Next slide. And so what we see is a lot of overlap with the criminalization of viral hepatitis. So it, the law may apply to viral hepatitis generally and just list hepatitis, or it may enumerate a specific type of hepatitis. So for example, in Idaho, um, the law there targets HPD. And so that's kind of the difference. You either see viral hepatitis or it enumerated within the statute. Um, transmission is typically not required. Again, a lot of times we're going to see this in a correctional setting or with a law enforcement officer. Um, and it's urine, feces, blood, spit, semen. And we know that if you're tossing urine, there's no risk of transmission, yet it's still being criminalized and we're still seeing felony level punishments for that. Um, with hepatitis, we also see sex without prior disclosure of status, needle sharing, and quote unquote knowing exposure, which could mean just about anything. Um, and it's often a very serious felony um, in Georgia. You could face up to 20 years in prison. So it's very, very harsh uh, punishment for someone living with viral hepatitis. Next slide, please. So this is an overview of the 13 states that criminalize hepatitis in some form or fashion. It's going to be the dark green states. Um, and this is also on our website for anyone that's interested. Next slide. Um, this is going to be a breakdown of how hepatitis is criminalized within those 13 states, whether it's specifically enumer enumerated type of uh, hepatitis, whether it's hepatitis generally, and a breakdown of what activities are also criminalized. This is also going to be on our website. Um, next slide. And so with viral hepatitis on the rise in the United States, um, treatment access is often not meeting that need. So we know most states uh, prohibit the possession of drug paraphernalia and syringe access remains inadequate and Austin touched on that um, in his presentation as well. We've also seen an ongoing crisis within the correctional settings. Um, incarcerating people based on their disease status will only exacer exacerbate the existing problem. And we have to look outside of the carceral approach um, and look more from a public health standpoint when we are trying to address um, ending the criminalization of viral hepatitis and criminalization based on anyone's health status for that matter. Next slide. So what are the problems with uh, criminal laws that criminalize viral hepatitis? They're unfair. Again, oftentimes you don't have to prove an intent to harm. It's enough that you know your status and don't disclose your status to the other individual before engaging in some sort of um, enumerated activity in the statute. They're excessively punitive. Most of these the times they're being charged with felonies. So for example, with the correctional officers, that's typically already a crime. Um, someone that is not living with hepatitis who spits on a correctional officer can be charged with a crime. However, if you have hepatitis, it's going to add on an additional felony, whereas if you don't have hepatitis, it's going to be a misdemeanor, um, depending on, on what state you're in. They're unscientific. So again, we know that these conducts that are criminalized pose no negligible or low risk. And that's oftentimes we cite that uh, information from the CDC itself. And still legislators want to argue that it's there to protect them. Um, it definitely promotes stigma concerning viral hepatitis just generally within our communities. 
Um, and it also conflicts with public health angles, and it doesn't take into account the universal vaccination um, for hepatitis A, B, and the access and cure for hepatitis C. Oftentimes, that is completely ignored when you're discussing criminal law reforms or efforts. Um, it's not something that they take into account whatsoever. And we know, obviously, that it already disproportionately affects our marginalized community and continues to push them to the bounds. So that would be people who are currently or formerly incarcerated, people who inject drugs, people living with HIV, and people of color as well. Next slide. So I touched on this a little bit um, earlier about how these laws came to be. So it's, it's either two primary approach, approaches, simultaneously criminalizing alongside HIV. So it'll be the same piece of legislation. And what they do is they'll change it from HIV specific law to include either infectious or communicable disease. And the definition for infectious or communicable disease is broad enough that it will also encompass hepatitis. And they do this under the guise of making it so that the law isn't discriminatory because it's not singling out individuals that are living with HIV. Um, the other way is adding hepatitis onto an existing statute. Um, so we touched a little bit on how Iowa, that was within their um, reform strategy was to expand the scope of criminalized conditions and that included viral hepatitis um, in the new definition when they reformed the law. So the result was that reckless transmission of viral hepatitis um, now became a class D felony and you could face five years in prison. So before hepatitis was not criminalized at all, it was just HIV. Then when they expanded the definition of conditions criminalized under that law, they made it broad enough to include uh, viral hepatitis and specifically called out viral hepatitis. Next slide, please. This is just another example of specifically enumerating a type of hepatitis within the statute. statute. So here we see hepatitis C being criminalized um, alongside HIV. And it's just an example of the language that they use within the law to criminalize hepatitis. Next slide. Um, here we have a new section that has been completely added to the law. And I'm not going to read these verbatim. Happy to share slides if um, people are interested. This is just a new section that was out added to the South Dakota law in order to criminalize hepatitis C. Again, this was not part of their law, but when they reformed it under um, Senate Bill 93, they added a new section um, so that they could criminalize hepatitis C going forward. Um, you'll also see in the end that it still criminalizes some behaviors that are little or no risk as well. Um, next slide. So the Positive Justice Project, one thing that we focus on when we do criminal um, reform, and we're working on not just HIV criminalization, but also viral hepatitis and hepatitis um, specific states, is no disease specific criminal law or sentence enhancements, requiring the specific intent to transmit or to cause harm, coupled with conduct likely to cause the intended harm. So trying to get rid of those laws that deal with correctional officers and um, police officers where there's little to no risk of transmission, um, which we did just recently have a, a success in Washington. So small victories. Uh, steps to reduce transmission or risk, such as the use of condoms or being on medication, regardless of whether virally suppressed, would mean that the person didn't have the intent to harm. Uh, couching the definition for infectious or communicable disease so there's no casually transmitted disease um, included in the definition. And also proportionate penalties to the harm that it caused. So no felony penalties and um, no new or increased penalties for others. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to try and wrap up. I know I'm coming on, on my time here. What we see is an intersection with drug and syringe use. We know um, all states criminalize, or 32 states criminalize possession of paraphernalia, including um, syringes, and there's this growing need for safe syringe access. Um, we've seen some bills success, but as Austin talked about, we've also seen a lot of efforts actually rolled back, um, and those efforts pushed back in terms of syringe access programs. Next slide. So people living with viral hepatitis who inject substances, there's criminal laws that target people living with HIV and or viral hepatitis who share injection equipment. 
laws criminalizing possession, purchase, or distribution of drug paraphernalia generally, um, and also drug use and possession. Next slide, please. Um, so there are over a dozen states that specifically criminalize the sharing of injection equipment, and a lot of times require mandatory testing as well. So we know that these laws also continue to harm our disproportionate, or excuse me, disproportionately harm uh, the same communities that we see with the criminalization of not only HIV, but viral hepatitis, and promote um, stigma and negative public health consequences in addition. Next slide. Um, these are just some of the intersections that we see with criminalization and syringe access as well. So promoting stigma, stigma and discrimination, undermine bodily and economic autonomy, and um, we also need to take into account considering how we could inadvertently be undermining each other's movements when we're talking about these intersections. Next slide, please. And so uh, CHOP has created two toolkits. We also have a third toolkit that we're coming out with um, this spring that is going to be specifically on the criminalization of hepatitis and it'll teach advocates how to interact with legislators and how to advocate for themselves and also have a breakdown of all of the laws. So we definitely encourage use of intersectional advocacy approaches and um, trying to avoid a myopic focus and thinking about how stigma against people living with HIV and viral hepatitis and drug users plays out in organizations or interpersonally. And I believe that was my last slide. All right, thank you, Jada. Um, yeah, just a couple slides here promoting the toolkits. Um, and now we are going to hand things over to Clay from the Arkansas Harm Reduction Project. Clay? Hi, hello. Um, so I'm Clay, can you guys hear me? Can y'all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm Clay. I'm the director of the Central Arkansas Harm Reduction Project. Um, we are a pretty new organization, um, and so I'm, I'm still very much learning. And so thank you guys for um, having me on here and hearing what I have to say. I feel really honored to be among y'all right now. Um, so we started about two years ago um, on New Year's Day as just the Naloxone Access Project as a just a community-based response to a lot of overdoses that were happening around us um, here in Little Rock. Um, and then uh, thanks to guidance of uh, a lot of people in the harm reduction like national community, we really quickly became a syringe access program. Um, a lot of that is thanks to AIDS United. Um, uh, basically everything that we've been able to do is thanks to them, um, as well as some other organizations like the Comer Family Foundation. I know that Mary is in here, hello. Um, but um, we, um, there's been on and off syringe access pre program presence in Arkansas, but right now, um, we are the only one that's really operating out in the open and we are the only one at all in our, our region. So we live in a really extreme, um, service vacuum. Um, we try to provide as, as much as we can, as far as, um, the most, basic um, survival-based supplies, stuff like naloxone, syringes, HIV testing, um, and we're trying to build out our services to um, have a big focus on serving people experiencing homelessness and also sex workers. Um, our organization is entirely run by LGBT people. Um, most of us are gender nonconforming lesbians, and uh, many of us are sex workers as well. So um, being gay, sex workers who use drugs has really informed all the ways that we operate, and we're still learning how to do everything, but that has given us um, our perspective on what we believe is um, an effective and accessible way to access, um, to, to make our program accessible. Um, we operate via a hotline system that's anonymous. Basically, anybody can reach out to us, um, let us know what they need, and if they're within driving distance of us, we'll we'll go meet them and we um, operate basically within like an hour drive radius. Um, and most of our, um, most of our participants are um, either here in Little Rock or in pretty rural areas surrounding. Um, and a lot of them are housing unstable. Um, so over the past couple of years, we've distributed over 3,000 
doses of naloxone, tens of thousands of syringes, and um, we receive back probably 10 or more overdose reversal reports every week. Um, and by delivering directly to people, we've been able to build rapport really quickly with our participants. Um, and we also um, do mail delivery, which might become our, our primary way of serving our participants right now because all of our volunteers um, deal with pretty serious health issues that um, prevent us from doing outreach at this time. Um, we serve all kinds of people, whether that's um, people who are in unstable or changing housing situations, people who are in really crowded communal housing situations. Um, a lot of people we don't meet because they might not trust us enough to reach out to the hotline and potentially never would. Um, and we serve them via secondary distribution. Um, and then also uh, parents of kids who use drugs and, um, and people who are reaching out to us just to learn more about how to be a better advocate for their friend and how to unpack their stigma, um, as well as other organizations that are looking to provide more competent and compassionate care. Um, and we do have some challenges um, that I'm gonna talk a little bit about right now. Um, so our, our biggest barriers to serving people, um, the number one is probably that um, we um, are in a red state where it is illegal to distribute syringes when we know that the intent uh, is for people to use them to inject drugs. Um, and so uh, even though we, um, we, we view our work as being pretty effective to reach people, um, we, we can't operate fully out in the open and that has been a, a pretty big barrier to people, um, to people feeling safe um, reaching out to us. Um, another um, issue that we've run into is funding. Although we've been really lucky to receive some funding, um, the federal ban on syringe funding has um, certainly gotten in our way, um, but there's not really a lot of state funding available either. Um, so um, many or really most of our participants are wanting more comprehensive casework um, uh, dealing with uh, housing um, and recovery. And as much as we want to provide that to them, we don't have the capacity. Um, we just have the capacity to bring urgent supplies to people who are using the same syringes over and over so they don't have to suffer that way. Um, we um, basically only have the, the bare minimum of what we need to operate, um, including a little bit of salary money um, and hopefully a drop-in center, um, just depending on how um, this current health crisis goes. Um, like I said, we, we have no idea what's going to happen with the current crisis um, because of our volunteers have some health issues. Um, so we might change to um, a totally male-based option. Um, and lastly, our, our biggest barrier to serving the people that we interact with um, is stigma and criminalization because it, it keeps people from feeling like they can trust us and reach out um, over a hotline. Um, and that's it. Uh, I, I know I don't have quite as uh, much to share as some of the other panelists, but please feel free to ask me any questions. Great, thank you so much, Clay. Um, and now we will move into the last presentation. Uh, so I'll turn things over to Frank. Hello, excuse me one second here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Zach just said, my name is Frank. Uh, I'm Frank Hood. I'm the manager of uh, hepatitis advocacy at the AIDS Institute. And uh, I'm going to spend my 10 minutes talking about uh, using your story to advocate. Uh, before we get diving into to all that, though, uh, anytime I talk with people about advocacy, I find it to be important to um, define what being an advocate is. Uh, because I imagine there may be some of you who are like, oh, well, I'm not an advocate. I'm just a person with lived experience. Uh, but in fact, that, that does make you an advocate, especially if it's, some, if it's a lived experience that uh, causes you to recommend a particular cause or policy. So I have this definition up here. Um, and, and really, I like to talk about the synonyms. Uh, you're a champion. You're, you're, you uphold, you support, or you back a particular uh, policy uh, proponent. So whether that's uh, increased funding for HIV and hepatitis or SSPs, uh, or you know, just 
wanting a dog park uh, on your block. That makes you an advocate when you are a champion. Uh, but we're going to specifically talk about what, uh, what some of your uh, federal partners are, are doing, or I should say some of your partners in DC are doing around uh, hepatitis and um, harm reduction. So if we'll move to the next slide, please. Uh, so the things that we're advocating uh, here in DC to Congress, and some of these will, will actually also match what's happening uh, around advocacy in the states, uh, are as follows. Uh, so one of the biggest ones is trying to lift the federal funding ban on syringes. Uh, starting a few years ago, syringe service programs nationwide, uh, if their state allowed it, could use federal funding for the operations of those syringe service programs. Uh, however, though, uh, they could not be used for the syringes themselves. Uh, and as I imagine many of you know, uh, it's a bit hard to operate a syringe service program without syringes uh, to, to exchange. But many uh, great syringe service programs across the country, more than 300 in fact, are doing that by finding uh, other accesses to funding. And we really want to, to cut that barrier out completely and allow them to use federal uh, funds, um, especially for those health departments that primarily rely on federal funds for their syringe service programs. So this is certainly something we're advocating for. We're also advocating for increased treatment access, uh, whether this is HIV treatment, hepatitis treatment, or substance use disorder treatment. Um, on the hepatitis side, we're, we've really been going after uh, Medicaid programs to continue to put barriers in place for uh, treatment access, whether that uh, is requiring a certain amount of sobriety, uh, having to go to a specific pr prescriber in order to re receive your prescription, uh, or just uh, making sure you progress to a certain F score before you're allowed treatment. Um, we've also seen similar prior authorizations put into place in marketplace plans, so we're, we're pushing insurers as well. Uh, and then something that has popped up recently as a part of the ongoing uh, struggles that we're facing with COVID-19 is ensuring that individuals who rely on medications to, to remain healthy have um, ample access to that medication. Uh, so for some of these drugs that are primarily only given in 30-day doses, uh, ensuring that individuals have more than just that one month to reduce the number of times they have to leave their home, um, as well as just any, it's just making sure that that is one less uh, item they have to worry about. Uh, we've been focused on increased vaccine coverage uh, across the country. Uh, much like uh, Jada touched on, we've been pushing against criminalization laws, uh, which we've unfortunately been seeing uh, creep into the hepatitis space. And then overall, we are definitely advocating for increased resources, um, whether it is for FSPs, for hepatitis and HIV uh, prevention, for surveillance, for testing, all of the above. Uh, many of these great programs uh, would not be possible without the resources uh, that we are able to uh, receive from the federal government from CDC, because uh, many states just don't want to fund it. And so it's really up to advocates to make sure that uh, states have that funding uh, to do work. So how do we do this advocacy? Uh, if we can move to the next slide. These are some of the tools we use, and, and really I'm just providing what it is we advocate on and some of the tools we use in order to highlight or to frame the, the conversation around uh, using your voice to advocate. So some of the ways that we advocate are through Hill visits, uh, which many of you are uh, at least familiar with the importance of because AIDS Watch has a Hill Day normally. Uh, every other year, AIDS Watch has a Hill Day, but uh, this year we are doing our Hill Day virtually. So uh, during these advocacy breaks uh, after each session, please do make sure you take the time to um, fill out those asks and, and get those into your, your senators and congressmen. Uh, but Hill visits is just when you're, you're going and meeting with an elected official, usually their staff, and, and this doesn't happen just in DC, you can go to your local con uh, congressional office or your state house uh, or senate, uh, they may be named something different in your state, uh, but it's just a one-on-one -on -one meeting for you to have a conversation about why these issues are important to you, how they impact you directly, uh, and what it is you would like to see. Um, one of the, the best tips I learned very early on when I was a, a fresh new advocate was um, when possible, when highlighting a problem, also highlight the solution. Uh, we also advocate through letters, uh, whether it's community sign-on letters, so different organizations coming together and showing their support for an issue, uh, whether it's a petition, which are uh, individuals coming together, or a dear colleague, which is elected officials coming together uh, to highlight the political 
um, push to, to other politicians. Uh, it's really a good way to show that you have political uh, clout on the issue. Um, briefings are another great uh, advocacy tool. Um, these are especially good when you have uh, like a very important uh, speaker. Uh, you know, if we were to have uh, to uh, Dr. Fauci for two hours, we would probably put him in a room to have a briefing so hundreds of offices could come to us and, and hear him speak versus uh, just taking him to one or two meetings in, in individual offices. So it's a great way to, if you have a panel of speakers or, or someone who you really want to make sure uh, is, is highlighted, um, that is a great way to do it. Uh, it's also a great way, another great way to put uh, patient voices or, or people with lived experiences voices uh, on the forefront. Uh, we also use media. Um, media is a great way to get in front of a large audience uh, and, and to bring public awareness to your issue. Uh, social media, um, be using it. I know social media has been touched on a couple different times in, um, within this AIDS Watch. Uh, there was a, a great session last hour uh, that I hope some of you were able to catch around using social media. Uh, best of all, it's free. Uh, and then coalitions and grassroots, which is really just the coming together of people and organizations around a, a shared goal. Um, so these are just some of the different ways we advocate, um, but they all have a common thread, and that is our next uh, slide, please, which is, these are all ways to tell a story. Uh, so the number one thing you can do in advocacy is to tell your story. Uh, I have done hundreds of Hill visits, and I will tell you that me walking in right now as experienced as I am and having a Hill visit uh, is not going to be nearly as effective as one of you coming for your very first Hill visit and actually sharing your personal story. Uh, I advocate on behalf of people living with uh, hepatitis and HIV and uh, people who are uh, people who use drugs, but I am not uh, a personal experience of those things. So I am just uh, repeating other people's stories and information. Um, and I can do that effectively, but I'm not nearly as effective as any one of you co going and, and telling your own individual story. And the reason why that's important is because uh, before this staffer hears your story, it is possible this individual has never met someone living with HIV or hepatitis or who uh, uses drugs, uh, who may be a sex worker. Like, they may not have had any experience. They may have preconceived notions. Um, they might be thinking of stigma uh, or in discriminating uh, terms. Uh, and you really have an opportunity to um, really shift how that mindset goes when uh, you're able to go and, and have have an opportunity to tell your story. Um, and one of the pieces I really wanted to, to highlight about telling your story, um, if, let's move to the next slide, uh, is, is different ways you can go about doing it. So here you are, maybe you've never done a Hill visit before. Uh, you've been asked to, to go onto the Hill and advocate for an issue. Maybe you've been asked to, to speak at a briefing or uh, a reporter has reached out or, or someone you know has connected you with a reporter to talk about an issue. Uh, you might be feeling anxiety and nervousness. Uh, maybe you don't like public speaking. All of these are natural. All of these are fine. Um, there's really, I don't want to say there's no wrong way of telling your story, but remember, it's your story. Uh, the way you tell it is up to you. Uh, there are some ways, though, that you can go about doing it, and there are some ways to make it as effective as, as possible. Uh, so some of the ways uh, you can go about it is you could tell your story with others. So let's say that you want to go and, and do this Hill visit, and you don't know the number of uh, the amount of money that's being asked for. You're not sure the number of hepatitis cases in your state. Um, you, you might not know some of these uh, little technical details but you understand your personal impact of, of living with one of these diseases. Um, and, and that's what you're sharing. So when you go with someone else who might know that information, you're able to sort of tag team. Uh, you would be able to go and tell your story, explain why it's important that you have access to your medication, explain what would happen to your health if you didn't have that access. Uh, what would happen uh, as a result of you maybe no longer being able to work because uh, you're off treatment and uh, you've had, you've you know, fallen ill as a result of that, you can no longer go to work, what that means around uh, your family life or, or, you know, if you're taking care of people. Uh, you could really just talk about these things in very personal details because um, it was, someone said this uh, in the last session, uh, I'm telling your story, or no, I think it was earlier today, um, 
these people put on their pants in the morning the same way you do. Uh, they're going to find common threads in your story that they're going to relate to, and it's going to hit them harder. And then the person that you've gone with to this hill visit or to this briefing can fill in those details about like, case numbers and uh, the amount of money that are being advocated for. So don't feel like you have to be an expert on all things to go and advocate because uh, you, you don't. And in fact, um, you know, you, you are an expert in your own way. So make sure that expertise is listened to. Um, another way you could tell your story in the advocacy realm is by um, going solo. So let's say you don't have access to someone that knows all these little details, but you still want to go and have this conversation. You can do so. It is okay to say, I don't know this number. I don't know that number. Uh, I can help find someone who does because there are plenty of advocates, myself included, that are happy to provide you with that information, to hop on the phone with uh, that staffer that you met with and uh, provide that information. Just as long as you have the uh, option and ability to go and, and tell your story because that's the important piece. Uh, and then the last one is uh, kind of a combination of the first two. Let's say you wanna go and fly solo, but you also want to know those uh, little salient details. You want to know the bill numbers, uh, the appropriations process, uh, the number of people living in, in your state or county or, or just nationwide uh, with these specific diseases. Uh, you can go and find that out. You can ask uh, other advocates for that information. You can hit up any one of us for that. Um, I'm telling you personally, you'll see uh, some of my information on the next slide, but reach out to me. I will go find information for you. Uh, thank you. Um, don't, uh, but if you feel like, um, sorry, something happened behind me and slightly distracted me. Uh, if you have the um, desire to go and educate yourself on some of these specifics, go, go right ahead and do so because that will just make you a, a stronger advocate. But it is not necessary to, to go and, it is not a necessary piece in order to go and tell your story. Um, another piece around telling your story um, as advocacy that I wanted to note is that you don't always know going into these hill visits how much time you'll have. Uh, the staffer may try to uh, uh, railroad you or just be really interested in what you have to say and so ask a lot of questions. Um, so I would spend some time beforehand going through and practicing. Uh, have a, like a three minute version of your story. Have a 10 minute version of your story. Uh, and, and make sure the points that you mention in your three minute version also are in your 10 minute version, uh, just with more detail. Um, think of it as your elevator pitch of, of your story, but uh, it's certainly important because you don't wanna to be in a situation where uh, you finally work through everything to have this moment and then the person you're meeting with sort of prevents you from telling your story. So make sure you're prepared to get out the information you wanna get out in the time you have and, and to, be able to do it in even less time if uh, other items uh, jump in. So I um, want to reiterate the previous panelists in thanking AIDS Watch for giving me the chance to come in and have this. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, I, I joke about, uh, I, I don't know how many telling your story trainings I've been a part of, but it's just one of those things that it, it is the sole basis of advocacy. Uh, and all of us have a story that we can tell, and which means all of us can be advocates for ourselves and, and our communities. Um, and uh, so let's, yeah, let's use our voices. Thanks. Thank you so much, Frank. And thank you to all of our uh, panelists today. So we are going to move into the question and answer portion. Um, so one second. Okay. I think folks should be able to see, um, our, our panelists again. Um, and if you are one of our panelists, um, if you wouldn't mind turning your video back on for the Q and a portion, um, and let's see, we have two questions and <laughs> several answers. So let me just um, do a little catch up here. So um, first question that has come in, and for folks that are joining us, um, there is a QA and a um, icon at the bottom of your screen. So if you'd like to ask um, a question to the entire panel or a specific person on the, on the panel, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, 
So the first question, and I'm thinking that this one um, comes from Clay, uh, or comes to Clay, is um, have you thought of just working with secondary exchangers in your work? Um, no, I don't think that we would ever limit it down just to secondary distributors, um, just because um, there are people who reach out to us who are isolated um, and we want to always be able to serve um, people who don't have a network of support um, because a, a big part of what we want is to shape stable networks of support for people ultimately. Um, but I would say that probably over half of the people that we work with are secondary distributors for us and they'll basically get a lot from us and just give to like every single person that they use drugs with. Thanks, Clay. Um, so then, um, oops, let's see. Um, okay. So um, then we have another question. Do we have specific SSP leave behind for our meetings? Um, so I can jump in on this one. Um, the we don't have um, like specific syringe access or SSP uh, briefings for meetings, but within the materials that our fantastic policy team put together, um, inside the briefings there are there's specific messaging around syringe services um, and drug user health. So um, if you are having a meeting and you want to talk about syringe access um, or funding for SSP, you can look within those. Uh, briefings to find information there. Um, and I don't know if Drew has anything else to add on that. Um, no, I will add that the Coalition for Syringe Access um, recently put together a sign on letter for the um, COVID 19 emergency appropriations bill. Um, and we are hopefully going to have a similar one um, directed at. Um, states and localities, particularly governors and uh, state houses, trying to encourage them to make sure that they keep the needs of people who use drugs um, at the heart of any sort of outreach they do around COVID-19. Um, and I can make sure to make sure the folks that are on this call um, are connected with that. Great, thanks Drew. Um, okay. Um, and Clay, just to clarify that the question about secondary exchange was um, they were saying doing secondary exchange just for this time period. So. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, sorry, I misunderstood. <laughs> um, I think that um, I think that we will be doing a lot more secondary exchange during this time period, and it has already um, started to comprise most of what we're doing. Um, but but I think that ultimately what we'll end up using as our, our primary strategy will be a, like a mail-based system. Cool, thanks Clay. <laughs> um, so the next question that we have is for Frank. And the question is, do you find it difficult to contact a local representative to advocate to, or is someone from their office usually open to listening? They're usually open to listening. Um, it's easier when you are a constituent. Uh, the, the, there are some offices who just straight up ghost me, uh, which whatever, that's their prerogative. Uh, but it almost never happens when uh, I am asking for a meeting uh, and have someone actually from that district. Uh, so if it is your local elected official, whether on the federal level or the state level, uh, being a constituent should be um, more than enough to get in and, and have a meeting. Uh, if for some reason people don't uh, respond right away, uh, so a couple things. One, it is a professional setting, so I would just say make sure your ask is um, not part of a like a long, uh, angry screed cussing them out. Uh, additionally, I would, um, if they don't answer right away, uh, follow up, do continual follow up, uh, try to reach out to other individuals in the office. Um, if they can't make that meeting, they might refer you to someone who can. But uh, I've had times where people just haven't responded to the first few. Uh, and I'll like just keep adding another email to that thread and be like, I'm following up on my last three emails from the past three weeks, uh, still trying to have a meeting with you. And uh, at some point, they just relent and will meet with us. So keep at it. Um, more often than not, you'll be able to have that meeting. Great. Thank you, Frank. 
Um, so next up, I think this question is probably for Jada, but um, everyone can feel free to jump in. Um, the person says, apologies if I missed this, but are there lessons from the fight against HIV criminalization that can be applied to the fight against hepatitis criminalization or vice versa? There certainly are. And I think one of the biggest lessons is not to undercut each other's movements. So um, one of the things that I highlighted in the presentation was when they try and make HIV criminal laws so that they are not HIV specific, they will broaden the definition of infectious and communicable disease so that it is broad enough to include hepatitis, but it's not stigmatizing because it's not just HIV. So one I think is to be completely educated when you're talking about law reforms in terms of are you broadening the law so it's going to criminalize individuals that were not subject to criminalization before reform efforts? Um, we don't want to make it, it worse for people living with other diseases just to say that a law isn't HIV specific. Um, and that's kind of the biggest thing that I've seen between the two movements in terms of lessons. I'm interested to see really how this plays out with COVID-19, the criminalization that we're going to see in full there, and how that affects criminalization reform efforts for HIV and viral hepatitis. So I think we should probably stay tuned because we're going to see a lot more lessons in full. Thank you, Jada. Um, did anyone else have anything to add about lessons from criminalization efforts? No? OK. Um, so our next question um, is for Austin. So Austin, if um, if someone is looking at the opioid, uh, the AMFAR database, and they find um, an error or something that might be um, outdated that they'd want to update, how should they go about doing that? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, please do let us know if you see things that don't match up with your experience. Um, the one thing I'll say is sometimes we're really limited by what data is available. I think the case where this is most often the case is with um, syringe service programs where the truth is there's not really a comprehensive listing of programs nationwide. Um, so what we do in situations like that is go to the best source that we can find. Um, so for that case, it's the NASEN database, which is a listing of their partners. Um, we know that it leaves programs off, um, but we're still really interested to hear about it. So please do let us know. Thanks for that, Austin. Um, before Zach continues, I just wanted to point out that in the uh, webinar chat, um, you have a uh, treatable bit of text um, that is the advocacy break for this particular meeting. Um, at the bottom of the tweet is a link to the action alert. So we encourage you to post this on Twitter and also Facebook, um, and also to click that link to write your members of Congress to encourage them um, to, among other things, um, rescind the ban on funding for syringes uh, with federal monies. Thanks, Drew. Uh, and thanks, Austin, for that response. Um, so there's no questions in the queue at the moment, but luckily we have um, six minutes left and I have a question. So um, please do, if you have additional questions, pop those into the Q&A box. Again, that icon's at the bottom of your screen. Um, but while we have these expert advocates on the line, I am curious about something. So last year, um, when I was doing in-person Hill visits with syringe access advocates, uh, we had a really challenging meeting with um, a representative's office from Kentucky, where I uh, am from. And around advocacy for syringe access, one of the things that comes up a lot, of course, is naloxone distribution and access to naloxone. Um, and one of the really tough conversations is around um, overdose prevention efforts. And um, I had a representative's chief of staff ask me how many times we should um, allow first responders to revive someone. And so my question is when you're in meetings like that and you get asked these really challenging questions, especially when you have personal experience uh, with substance use or with overdose or losing people that you really 
love and that mean a lot to you. Um, what are your recommendations for handling situations like that? Uh, I will say, um, well, first off, sorry that an elected official staff person had the goal to ask that question. Um, I would say be honest. I mean, obviously the answer is unlimited number of times. Um, and explain, and, and at that point, uh, I've not had that specific comment made in a meeting, but I've had similar, like, similar ones around, oh, certain service programs uh, encourage drug use. And some of the just tired tropes we continue to hear and have continued to uh, have data support isn't the case. Uh, I would stick with with um, two things. One, I would stick with the the facts um, around that. Um, I would stick with the facts. So in the case of like, you know, talking about um, the importance of overdose reversal and everything else, um, you know, anything that is factual, leave that out there. But also talk about the the emotional side. So uh, these are people's family. These these are brothers and sons and and mothers, uh, and and talking about about them being just disposable humans uh, is kind of unconscionable, and I would I would say that um, because that first responder is not going to know who this person is related to. They're not going to know anything about this person. They're also not going to know if this individual has received overdose prevention before, and so or reversal before. So there there's really just no way for uh, putting into place what this person is basically suggesting, which is limiting the number of reversals. Um, I, I want to hop in there and say that my experience um, advocating in Arkansas has been a little bit different because I've heard a lot of, since, you know, we have a pretty small population here, um, I have heard a lot of stories um, via people who are close to, to first responders and from first re responders themselves about Re reviving the same person again and again from an overdose and, and discussing that as a traumatizing experience. And while I can empathize with that, I, I will agree with you that the, the best way to answer those questions is to, um, to, to bring it back to the person's basic community, you know, that this is a person just like anybody who would be in, you know, in the policymakers family or whatnot, um, because that seems to be the, the most grounding way to do it. And I, I think that also it is really helpful when possible um, to, to work as much as you can with, um, with policymakers and ele elected officials who um, have some personal tie themselves to the, the overdose crisis or, or um, you know, are close to someone who, who does have a personal tie to it. That same point, Clay, um, this is actually another great opportunity for someone who has had an overdose reverse, mm -hmm. who is comfortable explaining that story as being someone to, to reach out and have those conversations with offices. Mm -hmm. um, because as we know, like overdose reversals are not just for people who are injecting drugs. It's also happened among folks who have had, uh, I mean, all overdoses are accidental, but I'm thinking mm -hmm. like folks who are just taking prescription medication um, non-recreationally and have, um, you know, misdosed or accidentally mixed or something else that uh, results in their overdose and needing to have it reversed. And so mm -hmm. um, if, if you have someone in that area or for that uh, congress congressional office that can go in and speak to that experience of having their overdose reversed, uh, it could really be a, an eye-opening experience. Thank you, everyone. Um, Let's uh, give like a virtual hand applause for our presenters today. Um, thank you all so much for joining us and uh, presenting on these topics. This was really fantastic. Um, the, we are at the end of this session. Um, I believe uh, there is about a 10 minute break before the final session of the day, um, which again, you'll have four options there and those will start at four o'clock Eastern time. Um, Thank you everyone for, for joining us. Thank you again to our presenters. Um, and I look forward to seeing everyone in person at next year's Day Watch. Bye everyone. Thanks, Jack. Thanks everyone. Bye, thank you.